start by giving a super brief overview of RAMP and how we use machine learning to solve business problems. Um, I then want to tell the story of our first proprietary machine learning model and its journey to production. Um, I'll talk about our decision to implement Metaflow and how we integrate Metaflow with Airflow. And then I'll wrap up by talking about the outcomes of this move. Um, by the way, if Metaflow piques your interest uh, and you're interested in trying it out yourself, you can look at the Metaflow sandbox on outerbounds.com. Outerbounds is a managed service for Metaflow built by uh, Zavin and his co-founder, Vile. Uh, there is a Met uh, obviously, Metaflow is open source, so you, know, you can try it out, but you're not tied to using Outer Bounds with it. It's a great way to just dip your feet into the water. So let's get started. So let's first talk about Ramp. Uh, if you haven't heard of us, Ramp is a fintech startup. And we got our start by offering a corporate car and spend management solution. Think like uh, American Express and Concur or Expensify. Um, kind of modern drug competitors are Navan, Brex, probably heard of them. They're, we're, they're fierce competitors of ours. So we also have other products for automating accounts payables called Ramp Bill Pay. We also natively integrate with accounting and ERP software to automate many of the manual tasks done by a finance team. And uh, we actually just yesterday, we rolled out our SaaS offering called Ramp Plus. And uh, that includes a number of AI-driven features as part of the Ramp Intelligence product. Um, and so data is at the core of our business, and we apply machine learning in several different domains. For instance, credit risk. We predict whether a Ramp customer will become 15 days delinquent in their next monthly bill. Um, so another surface area is fraud. So for a particular car transaction, we want to predict whether this transaction is fraudulent or not before we authorize it. Growth. And so when someone visits ramp.com, a prospect, we want to determine who it is and then predict how likely it is that they convert into a ramp customer and reach out to them if we think it's likely. And finally, within products. So within the application, a business administrator is looking at car transactions. And it's nice to be able to automatically code what accounting category uh, that these transactions uh, correspond to. And so we have a model that suggests these accounting categories on the fly. So just a brief overview of our stack. We use Snowflake as our data warehouse. Uh, we orchestrate with uh, Airflow, of course. That's why I'm here. Um, a lot of our compute infrastructure runs in AWS ECS, so our backend services, certain batch jobs as well. And then our data scientists, they leverage the open source PyData stack, so scikit-learn, pandas, familiar faces. So let's think about the, the ideal machine learning development lifecycle. Um, so a machine learning model, it's powered by batch inference and model training pipelines. If we take an example model training pipeline, the, ide the ideal development lifecycle is we're going to define and test that machine learning pipeline locally on my machine. Um, when we're ready, we want to move into a cloud environment. Uh, and uh, instead of transitioning or simply training that uh, pipeline on a small data set locally, we want to move into a beefier compute infrastructure in the cloud and train on a larger data set. And so this is where we'll evaluate model performance and maybe we'll iterate between steps one and steps two until we have a high performing model. And so when we're ready, we'll deploy into a production environment and start to orchestrate this model training pipeline on a schedule. Maybe we run some monthly training job or, or some other recurrence. And then finally, after it's in production, it's stable. We'll track everything. We'll log it and just monitor it in production. Sounds great, right? Well, I want to tell the story of when we productionized our first proprietary machine learning model and how not great that experience was. We started this late last year. Uh, and we were trying to productionize our probability of delinquency model, or PDQ for short. And so what that model does is it predicts the likelihood that a ramp customer will become delinquent in its next billing cycle. It's a measure of credit risk. And when we were approaching that, we were using an off-the-shelf vendor solution. And we immediately ran into issues. So first of all, uh, we could not develop the code locally and run the pipeline locally. Well, we could write it locally, but we couldn't run that pipeline locally. We had to deploy it to the vendor solution. Deployments took five to 10 minutes, then introduced a lot of friction when we're trying to iterate really rapidly. Second of all, uh, when it came time to test that pipeline uh, inside the cloud environments, it took about an hour to run, even for like really small data sets. And so that's five to 10 minutes of deployments, an hour to, to run that pipeline. That's at least an hour, hour and a half per cycle in that iteration. That's really slow. When it came time to actually deploy into production, jobs were flaky. They would just fail randomly for no reason. We'd retry them and they would succeed. It's very frustrating to work with. Uh, it made it really difficult to manage and increased the, or, you know, increased the length of the, the feedback loops there. 
So and finally, uh, well, actually, additionally on that, so there was poor support for Dockerized workloads, and we're big users of Docker within RAMP, especially for data science and machine learning. So finally, the logging was poor in that solution. So if we had the troubleshooting issues, we had to uh, uh, really struggle with that. Um, so, and I could go on, but the result is that we had really long feedback loops, and iterations were, were very slow. And so the result was is that this machine learning model, it took a little over four months from start to finish to get into production, which is unacceptably slow. Ramp is really well known for our product velocity. And the way that we accomplish that is by setting an extremely high bar for development experience and tight feedback loops. Data science cannot be an exception. And so that necessitated looking at an alternative. Um, ideally, we have a solution that uh, doesn't take an opinionated view on what tools that data scientists use for model, uh, for model development. They can use scikit-learn, they can use whatever framework they want. We take no opinions there. It provides a much better development experience. They can ship faster. Uh, on the flip side, we do want to take strong opinions on what infrastructure we use to orchestrate that machine learning pipeline. So the orchestrator and then also the compute infrastructure. Simply put, if we take a strong opinion, we choose one orchestrator, one compute infrastructure. That's easier for me to manage as a platform team. So it's easier to manage one orchestrator instead of multiple ones. So uh, Metaflow uh, is an open source framework uh, uh, written in Python, developed at Netflix. And uh, it's one of several solutions that we looked at and ultimately decided on. Um, and it really it bridges the gap nicely between that flexibility at the top of the stack for our data scientists and an excellent user experience and taking a strong opinionated view at the bottom of the stack for the infrastructure. Um, so it integrates nicely with um, uh, our data warehouse as well, fits beautifully into our ecosystem. Um, in terms of uh, how we use it, so uh, in terms of the, the typical flow, a data scientist will develop their Metaflow flow locally. You can kind of think of a Metaflow flow as anal uh, analogous to a DAG. Um, so uh, they'll develop it locally, and they can execute it as if it's a Python script. We can see Python flow.py run. It's very convenient. Um, in the slide here on the right, we see some example Metaflow code. We can see that it's a Python class. Uh, there's a start, predict, and end step, and this is a prediction flow, so we're going to load the model from, let's say, a model registry like MLflow or S3. We'll uh, generate some, some prediction data that are some uh, some feature data that we want to create predictions on and then create model predictions in that step, and maybe we'll write that back to Snowflake or some other uh, output location. Uh, and so when we're ready, we can really easily transition into a cloud environment by just adding double dash with batch in this case. And so batch is referring to AWS batch. You can also use Kubernetes as your infrastructure. Um, this is game changing for us because now we don't have to wait five to 10 minutes to deploy to the cloud environment. We just add essentially two tokens to uh, our Python command. We hit return and it just works. So that's significantly tight in feedback loops when we're doing offline model development. When we're ready, uh, we can easily deploy uh, into a more robust infrastructure using some orchestrator like step functions or, or Airflow uh, with another command like that. And this fit nicely into our development workflow uh, for, for data science. Uh, we have a rigorous development process for machine learning at ramp uh, and so and a CICD process to support that and Metaflow accommodated that really nicely. So. Uh, and then afterwards, we can track and log everything. There's a, there's a nice UI for us to look at the state uh, and, and logs for a Metaflow flow. Um, so it makes things uh, troubleshooting and, and monitoring things in production very straightforward. So uh, speaking of the Metaflow UI, here's a screenshot of it. Uh, you can see it, it's, it looks kind of familiar. You know, we see a, a step breakdown for a Metaflow flow right here, a nice Gantt chart to indicate how long each step took. Uh, you could hover over each step to uh, get more information on it, a tooltip will pop up. Um, and then also we have a nice uh, color scheme that's familiar to us in Airflow, green for success, red for failure, you get the idea. Um, and so yeah, um, uh, Metaflow, it's an open source Python framework for executing machine learning pipelines, developed at Netflix by, by Savin and his team. Uh, they open sourced it in 2019, and when they open sourced it, they integrated it with an existing production grade orchestrator and compute infrastructure. And they chose uh, AWS Step Functions and AWS Batch and ECS as the uh, orchestrator and uh, compute infrastructure. Um, and so when we're running Metaflow in AWS, we're referring to that deployment, orchestrating with Step Functions and AWS Batch or a compute with AWS Batch. And so that's what we use at Ramp. Uh, in terms of uh, what that looks like, you can trigger a Metaflow flow or step function state machine from Airflow. Um, 
you could use a uh, the AWS Airflow provider. You could use a step function start execution operator and a step functions execution sensor. And that works. Um, it'll work. It works OK, though. It's not amazing. We quickly realized that we needed to develop something custom. So we wrote our own Metaflow operator. You can see the invocation of that operator uh, at the bottom of the screen. And then also an example of uh, a task inside of an Airflow DAG. And so this is, uh, this is nice because we can also build operator links directly to the Metaflow UI or the Step Functions UI. So if I need to look to see why a Metaflow flow failed, uh, I can easily jump between the different contexts. So it's great for data scientists and machine learning engineers. Um, so here's a screenshot of that. If I just click that Metaflow task, you can see the Metaflow UI and Step Functions UI buttons uh, kind of at the bottom there. You just click that. It's like magic. So. And since productionizing uh, Metaflow on our platform, um, we've been able to build a self-service, user-friendly platform for our data scientists. We've been able to uh, scale the data science team uh, to two times its size, and they've been able to onboard themselves. So that's huge. It doesn't require any sort of white glove assistance from my team uh, to scale them out. They can just read a, a developer guide, follow the steps, do it entirely by themselves. Um, we've also been able to productionize eight new models in 10 months, and that's huge compared to where we were before Metaflow. It took four months to ship one model, eight in 10 months. That's significantly faster. So with Metaflow, we provide a reliable, intuitive, uh, and easy-to-use platform for data scientists to build data science models and maintain them in production. And it's significantly increased our, our, our development velocity with data science. Um, so if you're interested in learning more, we actually uh, just published a, an engineering blog post um, last Friday. Uh, look on, on Ramp's engineering blog. Uh, I'm also around. I'm a pretty friendly guy, so if you have questions, you can just reach out to me. Um, and uh, there's actually been a lot of uh, uh, open source developments uh, between Airflow and Metaflow directly. Instead of using step functions as your orchestrator, you can now use Airflow as your orchestrator. Uh, and so there's a blog post that uh, Michael Gregory at Astronomer wrote uh, on that, and uh, Sabin's actually about to talk more about that. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Ryan. Um, I'm happy to share what we have been up to within the Metaflow ecosystem over the last couple of years. Now, of course, as part of this conversation, you've already heard Metaflow, which somewhat sort of like creates a DAG and allows you to execute a DAG. Of course, we are at the Airflow Summit, which is yet another DAG orchestrator. And then Ryan, uh, Ryan also spoke about step functions, which can also execute DAG. So we've been talking about many of these different orchestrators, and it's useful to sort of like understand how do these actually fit in together? Do you actually need all of these? And what is the right way to even sort of like, you know, think about workflow orchestration? And that's what I'll focus on over the next sort of like 10 odd minutes. Let's see. Oops. All right, so before I dive deep into the workflow orchestration piece, let me just recap the capabilities of Metaflow and why did we even think about building Metaflow in the first place? So the story goes back to 2017. Me and my co-founders, we were at Netflix trying to figure out how do we provide more leverage to data scientists at Netflix. You're all familiar with their recommendation algorithms, but a lot more data science magic happens behind the scenes to create the content that everybody loves. And to allow for increased leverage, you really need to figure out how do you shorten the feedback cycle for any data science activity, as well as how do you allow a data scientist to do more? How can they be uh, more autonomous and go more end-to-end -end all the way from an idea to a model that's deployed in production? And which basically sort of like maps to these different stages. So you, know, you want to make sure that data scientists are able to play with the data in their organizations as easily, as effectively as possible. They're able to do as much work on their laptops because even though cloud is amazing, interfacing with the cloud at times come, uh, comes with many different paper cuts. So as much as um, all the work that people can do on their laptops, that's usually sort of like, you know, great for a first pass solution. But because you're then dealing with a lot of data, maybe you need GPUs, maybe you're training a lot of models, then sooner rather than later, you have to interface with the cloud. And then there is the next big hurdle that, okay, how do you basically take your work and lift and shift into the cloud? And what is the easiest possible way to do that? And then you, as, you sort of like, you know, start building up your data science maturity. Then you may have more people on your team and you have to figure out that, okay, how are these different people going to collaborate with one another on the same project? What is the story around reproducibility? If any of my model training runs fail, how do I actually recover from it? Because just imagine a scenario where one team is publishing certain embeddings, other downstream team is consuming those to training the model. If let's say something is wrong with the embeddings that are being generated, then the downstream team may run into a lot many more issues. So how do you 
basically recover from these cascading failures becomes a lot more important in large organizations. And then of course, once you are done with uh, creating a workflow, then you need to figure out that how do I actually run this workflow at scale, let's say every single night or whenever new data comes in. And that's where let's say orchestrators like step functions and Airflow come into picture. So this is some work that uh, Ryan has already covered, so I'll like very quickly uh, skip through it. So as you can see, defining a workflow in Metaflow is very easy and straightforward. You take arbitrary Python, all these steps that you want to annotate uh, with the step decorator, they show up as nodes in your graph, and then you can have these edges which are basically dictated by this self.next function. And you can then take this flow and you can just run this locally. So today you can just on your laptops do a pip install Metaflow, take this workflow and then run this without any sort of like any specific infrastructure that you would need to deploy. So that's sort of like really straightforward for people to come up with their first versions of the workflows. Uh, but then when you have to interface uh, with data, many times this data would be stored in many kinds of different data warehouses and you want to figure out what is the most safest, secure, quickest, uh, most cost effective way of pulling all of this data to wherever you want to run this compute. And we have invested a lot of time and effort in making sure that if your data is stored in Snowflake, in a blob store, in Databricks, then you are able to access that in a lightning quick manner. If let's say this workload is running on uh, top of an EC2 instance, then it's likely that using our tooling, you would be able to get, let's say, you know, upwards of 35 GBPS of throughput, which can be quite uh, consequential if you are, let's say, processing terabytes of data. Now, one big benefit of using Metaflow is that anytime you do any execution in any context, everything gets cataloged out of the box for you. So all of these variables that you see, these would be cataloged in uh, Metaflow's artifact store so that you can go back in time and answer these questions that, hey, you know, if, Ramp, uh, if Ryan at Ramp was training a model six months ago, uh, what was the model uh, that he created? Can I actually get access to that model or can I get access to the logs? And everything is cataloged and made available to the user without the user having to do anything specific. And then to the question of dealing with large amounts of compute, now of course it could very well be the case that you have many different steps in your workflows. Maybe you're okay with some steps running locally on your laptop, but some other step needs to run on a GPU instance, and how do you basically run uh, some of that compute very trivially? With Metaflow, you can, uh, it's, all a matter of dropping this resources decorator. So in this particular example, what will happen is that your start step, your join step, they'll actually run on your laptop. The train step will run in the cloud and uh, will take care of moving all the data uh, from your laptop to the cloud and back. So you don't have to think about uh, where do I store my data so that the data is available uh, in some other cloud instance. So all of that cognitive overhead is taken away from you. And then of course, I mean, uh, anything that happens in the Metaflow universe is automatically tracked. There's like a bunch of um, functionality as well. Uh, we have copious amount of documentation at docs.metaflow.org. If you're interested, please uh, go through that. But the big question that we need to answer here is uh, Airflow, Step Functions, Metaflow, uh, what's up with all the flows, all of these workflow orchestrators, and how should I even be think up, uh, thinking about it, right? Now, it is, a reality that machine learning at the end of the day, it's not an island. Uh, you could have, let's say, your data engineering workflows, your machine learning workflows, you could have security workflows, you could have microservices orchestration uh, happening within the same organization. And all of these different workflows are going to feed into one another. Your data engineer could be writing an ETL and then the output of that ETL could be flowing into a model uh, training pipeline. And let's say this model training pipeline then predicts uh, what is the lifetime valuation of any specific customer? And that could then again be picked up by yet another data engineering ETL uh, to paint some charts that sort of like, you know, some of the executives might be referring to. Uh, so it's really important to understand what these um, integration points are and how do you basically connect these uh, with one another. And one specific paradigm to help with that is can you basically use data engineering oriented tooling to create your data engineering ETLs, ML, oriented tooling for your ML ETLs or your ML workflows, similarly on the security side of the house, but still use a common workflow orchestrator because it, it is a fact that as platform teams, you want to reduce the overall amount of infrastructure that you are maintaining uh, at any given point in time. So I don't think it's sort of like um, a good idea that uh, a platform team should be maintaining, let's say, Airflow as a workflow orchestrator and then some other solution as well, just because uh, you, know, you want to run machine learning workloads. And it is very likely that you can use solutions like Airflow that have uh, been proven out for a longer period of time as just a centralized common orchestrator and run all your workloads on top of it. 
So in this particular scenario, you can have, let's say, your data engineering ETLs that are authored using Airflow, running on top of Airflow. You can have your machine learning workflows that are authored using Metaflow, but also running on top of Airflow. So in that particular universe, you basically get the best, best of both worlds, right? Because with Metaflow, you have already defined a DAG, so we can compile it down into something that Airflow understands. Now, you don't have to worry about XCOMs, you don't have to worry about Docker images, you don't have to worry about passing data from one step to the other, you don't have to worry about how you are doing your local development and then moving uh, or figuring out sort of like, you know, what things work, what don't. One big benefit is if this workload uh, fails for whatever reason, you can actually just open your laptop and you can resume that compute on your laptop, replicating that failure scenario. And then once you have figured out that issue, you can fix it and again push it all the way uh, to Airflow to resume that compute. And then of course, I mean, it's also a bona fide Metaflow flow, so you get all the benefits there too. Um, I know we are running short on time, so I'll just like quickly recap on the infrastructure stack that is available through Metaflow, so you are able to access any data store. Uh, of course, I mean, we have out-of-the-box integrations with all the popular blob stores that the hyperscalers offer, as well as Snowflake and Databricks for compute. Uh, for example, Ramp is using AWS Batch. Many of our adopters use Kubernetes as well in all the major clouds. Uh, you get these orchestration and versioning capabilities that are already built into Metaflow, so you're able to start executing these workflows locally. And then when you're happy with the workflow, then you can deploy this flow onto Airflow, for example. And then, of course, you're not limited in terms of what you can do inside these workflows. You can use any Python library, any machine learning framework to train your models. Uh, so that's about Metaflow. That's about Airflow, the work that we have been doing. There's plenty of blog posts out there that I would uh, happily recommend. If you're interested in trying out any of these things, you can go to this URL, outofbounds.com slash sandbox, and you'll be able to provision infrastructure that will allow you to try out all of these things that we spoke about today. But if you have any questions, Ryan and I would be happy to take this on. Amazing, thank you so much, yes. We did run out of qu time for questions, unfortunately, but uh, if you wanna catch either of them around in the hall outside, they'll be around for the foreseeable future. Um, and yeah, thanks again for such a great show. Another round of applause.